Hello everybody and welcome to the Tuesday edition of Video Clips and uh, as usual I have a couple of announcements and um, one of them is in response to something you've asked for so if you don't think that we listen to what you tell us we actually do and that is um, several of you in the last year or so have said you have all these different courses for people to take and um, some of them are clearly designed to help people who are um, health professionals or they're going to become health professionals and all that sort of thing but why don't you put some package together that is just for family health. People who just want to learn to take care of their own family and maybe a few friends, that sort of thing. So we now have a special family health um, uh, package and it includes things like men's health, women's health, children's health, uh, food over medicine, and it's designed to just, just for the person who's interested in learning for his or her own satisfaction and to help the immediate family or extended family for that matter. And we've got it priced, really special price. It's an intro offer. I promise you'll save a lot of money. We always do that when we introduce new things. And so um, for those of you who asked for it, you can now get it. The other thing is I'm running a special right now, buy one food over medicine course and get one free, which means that if you have a buddy who wants to take the food over medicine course, you can each do it um, for half price or you can gift it to somebody, the extra course, whatever. So if you're interested in either of those things, send me an email at pampopper at msn.com. And if you're watching this and you're also interested in a career, in other words, I mentioned before, we have a lot of stuff for people who are in the healthcare business or planning to get in the healthcare business, um, if send me an email. We can always set up a time to talk and I'll give you some information to look at. All right, so I've chosen two things to talk about today, both of which are related to cancer. Um, so we'll start with, most people know that many if not most cancers are preventable and several contributing factors are pretty well understood, like diet and lifestyle habits. But one thing that I became aware of a few years ago is the importance of focusing on the rest of it too. More attention should be paid to things like stress, emotional state, and social connections. And one of the reasons why I brought this more to my own consciousness and brought it into the conversations I have with people is after reading Kelly Turner's book, Radical Remission, where she talked about the terminal cancer patients who survived and how they did it. And yeah, they ate an ideal diet, but they also did a lot of other things that helped them survive. And, and I really learned a lot from that book that I have um, integrated into, as I mentioned, my articles and the things that I talk to people about. Cancer is a complicated disease, and if you're gonna prevent it or treat it, it requires a whole person approach to health. In a recent study, researchers looked at the effect of one factor, recent divorce, on both cancer diagnosis and outcomes for over 83,000 patients. Newly divorced patients had worse outcomes. They were significantly more likely to be diagnosed with advanced cancer when compared to those who were either long-term married or long-term divorced. They were also less likely to get curative treatment and they had the worst survival outcomes when compared to long-term married people. On the other hand, newly married people and long-term married people had much better survival outcomes than the recently divorced. The researchers cited several reasons why recent divorce might have this impact. These include loss of health insurance or financial uh, losses, which can interfere with getting the best care, disruption in living circumstances, and negative changes in social networks. Divorce is often preceded by a lot of conflict and increased levels of both pain and depression and, and stress. Divorced patients often have worse diet and lifestyle habits. They're more, more likely to smoke, they're more likely to abuse alcohol, they tend to exercise less, and they eat less, eat less healthy diets in general than their married counterparts. Well, these factors increase the risk of cancer, but also increase the risk that the cancer will be more aggressive and possibly not respond to treatment. Additionally, research shows that lack of social support often leads to less adherence to treatment and even a tendency to not show up for treatment appointments. This may be exacerbated by, exacerbated by divorce-related depression. The researchers concluded that recent divorce is, quote, an acute disruption of a patient's social support network and is associated with the worst cancer outcomes. They advised that cancer patients should actually be questioned about these types of things and medical care should include assistance when needed. And of course that usually doesn't happen and one of the reasons is the short visits that people have with their doctors just don't really allow for much fact finding and conversation and fortunately there's more conversation about that right now but it still hasn't been fixed. 
Now, I want to be clear, this information doesn't, should not be interpreted to mean that um, people should remain in unhappy marriages in order to reduce their risk of cancer. That's ridiculous. Nor should it mean that divorced people or recently divorced people are doomed and destined to get serious diseases like cancer and die earlier. Rather, the information is a wake-up call, I think, first for people to pay attention to all of the factors that contribute to health. And these include the obvious, like diet and exercise, but sleep and stress and relationships and social support and interaction, a spiritual life. And one other thing, and this came out of Kelly Turner's book, having a really strong reason for living. Another thing that I'll mention is disruptive life events like job change or moving or family illness and divorce tend to make people even less diligent about taking care of themselves when these kinds of things really should be the sign that it's time to be more diligent because of the stress associated with them and the increased risk of all kinds of diseases, not just cancer, that come about as a result. Um, so healthcare providers, I think, should be discussing diet and lifestyle factors a lot more and social connections and emotional health a lot more than they do, um, but particularly when patients are going through a stressful event. Um, so, you know, those are the, those are the things that uh, we don't have as much hard science on, but um, I think Kelly Turner's thousand patient study was pretty good evidence for the fact that they're important. All right, so the next thing I want to talk about is treatment for cancer. And as you know, if you've been watching me for a while, I'm quite the critic. I don't have a lot of enthusiasm for a lot of what goes on in the cancer business. The development of anesthesia and the ability to perform surgery in a sterile environment, both of which been, have been available for well over 100 years, have allowed patients with localized cancer to, have, uh, to benefit from surgical removal of their tumors, and outcomes are pretty good for localized cancer. But there have been few advancements in the treatment of advanced metastasized cancer. In spite of this, the public is led to believe that we are just so close to finding a cure for cancer. And you hear things like terms like miracle treatment being used to describe drugs under development. And uh, lots being written about this right now. These descriptions are misleading. And in fact, in an article in the Journal of the American Medical Association, two doctors reported that misleading terms are used 50% of the time to describe drugs not yet approved by the FDA and 14% of the time to describe drugs that have only been proven to work in mice. The excessive hype extends to drugs that are approved, like immunotherapy, which is often described as a breakthrough treatment or a game changer by doctors, but not all agree. Dr. Vinay Prasad is a hematologist-oncologist, and Nathan Gay is an oncology fellow at Oregon Health and Science University. They recently did an analysis that showed that only 8% of all cancer patients can benefit from immunotherapy. At least 92% will not. And there is no real reliable way of determining which patients will. In spite of this, the drugs are incredibly expensive, costing as much as several hundred thousand dollars per year. Two of the most commonly used are uh, cost between $100,000 and $150,000, and they have side effects that include flu-like symptoms, heart palpitations, diarrhea, infection, arthritis, and potentially fatal allergic reactions. Now, not everybody believes that, or not everybody is as um, pessimistic, let me put it that way, as these two doctors, and as I tend to be about this. Dr. Jeff Weber, just to present the other side, is a medical oncologist, sees things differently. He says the sheer volume, um, uh, the, uh, the number of immunotherapy trials currently going on will result in the identification of new therapies which um, in the next few years should cure cancer patients. And you know, I'd like to believe Dr. Weber, um, but I, I guess I'm, I'm a little bit jaded by history and, and the reality of what goes on. Well, desperate cancer patients are highly vulnerable to um, listening to this type of thing. I mean, headlines such as lung cancer patients live longer with immune therapy. Um, that catches the eye of a cancer patient for sure. Now, just to give you the disconnect between what the headline says and the reality of what's going on, the article under this title reported on a combination of Keytruda, which is an immunotherapy drug, and chemotherapy. Dr. Rory Herbs, chief of medical oncology at the Yale Cancer Center, is an enthusiastic promoter of this therapy. And what he says in this article is, quote, I've been treating lung cancer for 25 years now, and I've never seen such a big paradigm shift as we're seeing now with immunotherapy. Well, what is this big paradigm shift that Herbst is referring to? 
Well, it was reported in the New England Journal of Medicine, and it's almost certain that cancer patients will never read this article before making a decision about this treatment. The median follow-up time in the study was only 10 and a half months, and the estimated survival at 12 months was 69.2% in the immunotherapy group and 49.4% in the group that did not have the combination uh, treatment. Uh, living longer in this study, is what I'm saying, was defined as survival at one year, which I don't think is the result that most cancer patients are seeking. They simply don't know that that's what this will deliver at the time that they sign up. Quality of life during this one year was also an issue. Adverse events occurred in 99.8% of the combination patients who got immunotherapy and 99% of the placebo chemo group. Discontinuation of all drugs due to adverse events occurred in 13.8% in the combination group and 7.9% in the placebo chemo group. Now it's true that the side effects are only marginally worse for people getting the combination treatment uh, that included immunotherapy, but the results were just not that much better. Add to this the estimate that only 8% of all patients are going to benefit from this, and it's difficult to believe that any medical doctor would refer to this as a paradigm shift in cancer treatment. I mean, the disconnect between what people say and the reality of the situation just continues to astound me. Well, belief in the efficacy of these treatments tends to make doctors very effective salespeople. Patients agree to treatment based on the false belief that they really will live longer, and the definition of live longer usually isn't just 12 months. This often results, in addition to the misleading part of it, it results in financial stress for the family because most insurance plans now have significant co-pays and deductibles, and medical treatment is one of the leading causes of bankruptcy in our country. Other consequences of the misplaced belief are failure to look into alternative treatment options and a decrease in quality of life. Sometimes just palliative care can be more productive. It not only increases or decreases pain and makes patients more comfortable, but some studies have shown that it prolongs life. Doctors should be having informed discussions with patients during which these type of data are reviewed, but this isn't happening, which means patients have to do their own research or use services like ours in order to make good choices. Sometimes the good choice is to look for alternative treatments when presented with this type of information, and sometimes it's to die with dignity on one's own terms, but any choice should be based on fact and not hype. All right, that's all for today. As usual, pass this on to anybody who you think would enjoy watching it, and I will be back to you on Thursday with more news.